Okay, uh, okay, let's start. Uh, so um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Miguel Aragon Calvo. Um, Miguel uh, finished, well, he, he did his PhD in astrophysics in the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And after that, he, he was a postdoc and also an assistant research, research scientist at Johns Hopkins University. Um, we, we did not overlap at Johns Hopkins, I arrived a bit later. Um, and then after that, he was a uh, a research scientist in, uh, at the University of California in Riverside. So we actually met during this time period when I visited uh, Riverside. Um, Miguel was in charge in, in, of, of some kind of, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what you call it, like a media lab or, or something, but he had a lot of uh, cool toys, like a 3D printer, 3D screen or, or something to visualize a cosmic, a cosmic wave and, and things like that. And since 2016, um, He's an, well, he's a researcher at um, Instituto de Astronomía in Ensenada. So he's one of the uh, recent acquisitions uh, over there. Um, so his, his, um, his original work uh, is, uh, was on the, on the cosmic web, uh, large-scale large structure. And actually his work has been very, uh, has had a lot of impact in, in that field. Um, and more recently he has, he's interested in uh, uh, neural networks, um, um, artificial intelligence, and uh, that sort of thing. So he will uh, tell us more about it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Vicente. And uh, thank you, Vicente and Sundar, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you guys. I hope to be soon in person, but now I will be virtually. Um, I'm going to stop my video, okay? Because uh, my internet connection is not very fast, so just to make sure that everything runs, runs smoothly, I'm going to turn my video off. And I think I can turn it off and then keep the, share the screen. Okay, uh, can, can you see the screen? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, some experiences using artificial intelligence in astronomy and a little bit of industry. Uh, like I said in the last intelligence with the idea of applying this into astronomy, but because artificial intelligence is such a big thing in industry, I also had the opportunity to work with a, with a, a startup. So I will share, share a little bit of my work doing with this startup, which is based in New York and Seattle. Uh, so why, why artificial intelligence? I think I don't have to convince you that now artificial intelligence is coming, it is a revolution. Uh, we have systems like IBM Watson that can be used for medicine. We have uh, this personal assistant. Uh, we have uh, computers that can play chess or the play of go, the self-driving cars, people to make a fake, a fake video that they put Nicolas Cage face in every movie they can find. And now, other practical applications, people um, trying to uh, cut images from backgrounds, like in this case, a car, or this something that I did with this uh, startup. Uh, we, we wanted to find furniture in, in just in pictures of, uh, for interior design, and here we, we got a, a chair from a, from a general picture. This was done automatically. Now, astronomy, of course, uh, is not the exception. We have been seen a lot of uh, work in this area in the last years. Now, this is just a couple of papers. But every week there are papers on, on artificial intelligence. So uh, a couple of years ago, well, actually last year and a couple of years ago, I started working on, on this and applications of uh, artificial intelligence to astronomy, trying to find cosmic structures. I will tell you a little bit more about this. This is a neural network. This is the result from a neural network that uh, takes a density field as an input and gives you the, the distribution of filaments as an output, which is the, the same technique that we have been using to find chairs in interior design images. Now, before I continue, uh, I usually like to make my talks very interactive and I, I like to make the public participate as much as possible. So I know this is not the ideal way of doing it virtually, but if anybody has a question or a comment, uh, please just, just uh, just go ahead and, and, and let's keep this more like a, like a conversation than, than a serious seminar. 
So I will give you a small introduction on neural networks because I think it is very important to understand what these things are and how they work before we can actually appreciate how, how what the, the kind of things that we can do with them. So I will spend like half of my talk giving you a very short introduction of, on neural networks and I will show you again some very fast results which will be a little bit like an anti-climax uh, but I think it's, it's, it's for the benefit of all of us because then we will know what we are talking about. So I will start with a very short introduction to neural networks. So what are neural networks? Well, the basic is, the basis is a, is, is, is a biological neuron. So conceptually, they are, they, they are inspired in a biological neuron. So how do they work? So we don't know the detail, but we know that uh, a neuron receives information from the exterior, which could be a sensor or could be another neuron. And then it does some processing inside and depending on the processing and the signal that you receive, it sends information to another neuron. So it takes, it collects information from the exterior, then processes information and then fires or gives you, gives you some answer according to this input. So I'm going to talk about a kind of artificial neuron called perceptron, which is the simplest artificial neuron that, that we, can, we, can, we can make. And this is an, this is an, uh, uh, more or less the same component. We have some inputs, which could be, uh, could be signals from a physical process, could be pixels from an image. Uh, this, these inputs are processed by the, by the perceptron, which are, they are multiplied by some weights. And these weights tell us how important are these signals. So we, we multiply the signal by some weights and we apply some function that I will show you in one moment. Now, what, is the, what happens inside the perceptron? So what happens inside the perceptron is very simple. It's just a weighted sum. So we have some inputs, and we have the weights, and we, here we compute the weighted sum of the inputs plus some constant component. So what we have here is just a linear system. And then the output of a neuron is usually applied to a nonlinear function. And I will show you later why we have to do this. So uh, give me one second, please. Uh, so the perceptron is basically consists of two parts. It has a linear, a linear part, which is just a linear, linear system, a weighted sum of inputs. And it has a nonlinear part, which in, in this case is just a, a step function. So in order to make it more clear, I'm going, to, I'm going to train one neuron. And we are going to go to one example of how to train one neuron with a very simple problem. So I have a problem here. And this problem is I have two different sets of points. I took some measurements and I, I, I collected some, some, some data points. And then I know that this, this, this sets corresponds to one class, to class A, class A, and this corresponds to class, class B, you know, a class zero or class one. So this could be, for instance, a blue galaxy, and this could be red galaxies, you know, in a, in a color magnitude map. So then uh, this, these are points that I classify by I. So I want to make a system that will allow me to tell if a new point is added here, to which class it corresponds. I'm going to add a new point, and I want to know if this point corresponds to class zero, class one, and I want to do this in an automatic way. So how would I do it? So the easiest way to, to do this would be just to trace a line, which is what we will do. No? I just trace a line here and, and separate class zero from class one. And that's what we are going to do. But we are going to do it with a neural network. So I have here a very similar, a, a very simple neuron. This neuron has two inputs, which is uh, X and Y, or X1 and X2. And they get multiplied by some weights, and I need also a scalar. Uh, this constant uh, factor, now I think now it's clear to see why we need a constant factor. We are actually going to find a line dividing this, this space. And the line needs a constant factor, otherwise it will pass through the origin, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass all these points through the network, to, through the neuron, to train it, it, to learn the weights. What the ne neuron learns are the weights. This is the important part, the W's, because this, this is the part that I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know the, the slope and I don't know the constant. So I have to know the, final, the, the best or the most optimal set of weights for my, for my neuron. So how do I do the learning? I have to know the weights. So in order to, to know the weights, what I do is uh, I, pass the, I pass my points through the neural network and compute the output. And then from this output, 
I'm going to com I'm going to compare the output of the neuron with the real output that I know. So it's going to tell me class zero, class one, and then I'm going to compare it with the, with the real class. And from that, I will get an error. So I'm going to obtain my weights with this very simple formula, which is that the weight at a given time is equal to the, the weight at the previous time plus some uh, learning factor which I define times the error times the input of that corresponding weight. So we will go through one example uh, by hand so you will see all this uh, more clearly. Okay. <clears throat> okay, give me a second. So what we want to do is basically divide our space into two sections with a, with a, with a linear function. Because the weights, we can rearrange the weights as this and we just get a linear equation. So that's what we want to find. We want to find the slope and the constant for this linear equation. So I'm going to start training my, my neuron. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass, to pass all the points one by one through the neuron and then compare the result that I get from the neuron with the actual result that I know. So I take this point. This point is the point 0 0.25 and 5. So we, we see here 0 0.25, 5. Because I don't know the, the, the initial weights, I'm going to give it weight zero. I could give any weight, but I'm, just, I'm going to start with weight zero because it's just the easiest example. So then I start with weight zero. So I pass this point through the, through the neuron. So I multiply 20, 0.25 by zero, 0.5 by zero. So I get a zero here. So I pass this through my activation function that tells me that if the value of this sum is larger or equals to zero, then it's going to give me a one. So this neuron tells me that this point corresponds to class one, but I know that this point corresponds to class zero. So it's actually wrong. So my error is the, the actual class minus the predicted class. So I have an error of minus one. Okay, so now I can, I can use this error to update my weights because I know here that the weight is the weight, the, the new weight is the weight at the previous time times as a learning factor, which I define by, is just a, a pre-parameter, I define by point one times the error times the input of that weight. So my error is minus one. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply, well, I just uh, make this, uh, evaluate this equation here, and I'm going to replace these weights by this new weight. So that's what we see here. So now we have new weights. My new weights are 0 point, minus 0 0.5 and so. Then I get a second point. So I take now a new point, I pass it through the neural network, but that the, the, this neural has new weights. So this point is 0 0.75, 0, 0. So I, I make this, uh, I perform this um, weighted sum and I get this value. So now the, the, the activation function tells me that if, it's, if, it, if, if this sum is uh, smaller than zero, then it's class zero. So, and I know that this is class zero, so the error is zero. And then I go through all my points. And as, as I go through my points, these weights are going to change. When I go through all my points, I call this one epoch. It's like when we were doing, I know in Spanish you call planas, no? At, at school you were making planas when you were learning your, your words and your letters, no? It's the same. So you pass all the points through the network and you call this one epoch. Usually one epoch is not enough. You have to pass the points several times to do several epochs. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to do it by hand, but I'm just going to, to go through several epochs and show you what happens. So we start here. The weights are zero because I don't know, I'm going to start, to start training. I go through all the points and this is my new line. And these are the new weights, which we see that it's not, it's not there yet. It's, it's, it's getting there, but it's not really there yet. So I'm going to, to go through the points one more time. So I have now two epochs and you see that my weights are changing and my line is getting closer to what I want. So I'm going to go through several epochs and at some point it will converge. So after 12 epochs, after going 12 times through the points, I get these, these weights that help me divide my two classes. So now for any point, for any new point, I just have to pass this new point to my neuron and it will tell me if it belongs to class zero or, or class one. So this is in a nutshell, uh, the, 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 the way a, a neural network works. This is a very simple neuron. Let me go back here. This is extremely simple neuron. It has only two, in, two, two inputs. Now, everything what I'm going to show you now is based on this kind of neuron. 
The difference is that there will be more inputs and this function, the activation function will not be, will not be this very simple. The function will, will be something a bit more complex, like a linear function or a sigmoid or a tangent. But it will be the same idea. So everything what I'm going to show you now is based on this very simple neuron. So now one neuron is good for linear things, but it's just as good as a linear system. Sometimes we want to solve deeper problems or more complex problems. And for that, we use deep neural networks. So what is a deep neural network? Well, it's nothing but just stacking neurons on top of each other. So like our brain, our brain consists of neurons connected to other neurons. We don't have all neurons, well, just one single neuron with a lot of inputs, no? with, with trillions of inputs. We have many neurons connected to other neurons. So the same here. This is a very simple problem, very simple example. It's like a toy example where I want, to, I want to predict the price, the price of a house based on four variables, which are the size of the house, the number of bedrooms, the zip code, and the wealth of the neighborhood. So these are simple variables, and this is a complex variable, the price. And the, I know that the price depends on this one, but how, how is it dependent? So I know that from the size of the, the house and number of bedrooms, I can get the family size. And I also know that the zip code, at least in the US, and the wealth of the neighborhood tells me the quality of the schools. So you see that there is a, this neuron here combines these two variables and makes, gives me a more complex variable, which is family size. And this, this neuron does the same. Take the zip code in the wealth of the neighborhood and gives me another variable, which is school, school quality. So the neurons give me, a, uh, this, this layer of neurons give me one level of abstract, abstraction. So text, it, they take me from a simple set of variables to something a bit more complex. And then this neuron combines family size, how easy it is to walk in the neighborhood and the school, school quality and give me a new, a new variable which is even more complex or more abstract, which is the price. So conceptually what happens in a neural network is very similar. So we have, a, for, for instance, we have an image. This is just a concept, you know, this is again a toy model. We have an image and we are, the image corresponds to a bunch of pixels. So we analyze the pixels with some neurons which are basically filters and the first layers give me very simple features in the image, just, just uh, changes in, in light. They are just basically gradients. Now, other layers combine these gradients to give me a bit more complex features like an eye or a mouth or a nose. So you can see, for instance, you focus on this eye. This eye, I can express this eye as a dark region, a light region and a dark region, just like this, one of these uh, gradients. So you combine gradients, you can, you can generate complex images. And I can, I can combine these images to create finally a face. And from this face, I can then make a decision and say that this person is Sarah. So you see that uh, deep neural networks give me a, a, a way of abstracting information. As I move deeper into the network, I just abstract the information in the, in, the, in the original image. So I'm going to talk about a very particular kind of a neural network or convolutional neural network, which is a kind of an, a neuron that we use for analyzing images. Now, uh, you remember our perceptron has had a bunch of weights, a bunch of inputs with weights, and the inputs could be anything, not could be just any, any, any signal. Now, in a convolutional neural network, what we do is we, re we arrange these inputs in a, in a pattern, in a bunch of pixels. So I have here my inputs. I have an, this is a neuron that has nine weights, nine inputs and nine weights. So you see, the only thing that I did now is arrange nine inputs of my, of my neuron into a pattern of three by three. It's a little matrix of three by three. So what this neuron does is uh, it, it find, well, it will, will learn some weights that will correspond to some pattern. Like here we see, we see these little patterns and it will go through, all, through every, every section in the image and at every section of the image, it will give me some, some, some response and it will put the response in a new image, which is the feature image. This is, very, this is the same idea as a convolution. It's not, it is not an exact convolution the, the way we do it in astronomy, but it's the same idea. So we have a filter and we, buy the, we convolve the filter, or the image, perdón, with this filter, and we generate a new image. We call this in, in computer science, the feature image. So the feature image con contains a region that look like my kernel like my, my neuron. So I will use this, these words for the, same, for the same thing, neuron, filter, or kernel. They are basically, they are, they are the same thing. So you see here, my activation is not anymore 
is not um, a step function, but now it's something a bit more complex. This is called a rectified linear unit, which is uh, it's just very, very simple. There are many activations. This is just one of them. So just to, to reinforce what, what we just said, uh, now our neuron will be a filter, in this case, three by three. And we want to learn the optimal ways to filter our image and find some patterns. So the, the filter will pass through the image and will generate a new image, which is called the feature image. So now that we know the basics of a convolutional neural network, let's see uh, the, 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 structural, the, the structure of, of a basic deep neural network. So a basic deep neural network, the one that you will see all the time um, you know, in the news on like Google and all these companies, consists of basically two parts, which is a convolutional part that, that is going to extract features from the image, and then a fully connected layer, which is going to combine these features to give us some prediction or some classification. So we will go in more detail on this. So just wait, wait a little bit. So what, it, so what the feature extraction part of the network does, it takes an image and then it, it composes the image with filters. And for every filter, it generates a new image. So in this case, we have five filters here. So every filter or every neuron is going to give me a new image, which is a, a feature image. So I have five feature images corresponding to five neurons. Now, the next step, this is one layer. So I take this layer, every filter in this layer every, that produces an image, and I filter these images with new filters. Just like we, the same way as we saw in this case, I take the output from those neurons and I analyze this output with another, with another, neuron, another neuron. So then I take these filters, the output from these filters, and I filter these outputs again with another, in this case, with five filters again. So I produce five new images, which now are the combination of these five filters, and so on and so on. Now, something very important is every time I pass my information, my images to a new layer, I lower the resolution. This is called a max pooling operation. So what I do is I take, in this case, uh, two by two pixels, and from two by two pixels, I get the maximum value to generate just one pixel. So I lower the resolution by half. And I do, it, I do this several times. So I take my image, I analyze the image with a bunch of filters, I lower the resolution with this operation. There are other operations, this is just one. And then once I lower the resolution, I apply new filters, and then I lower the resolution, and I apply new filters, and I do this several times. So why do I have to lower the resolution? So this is something very important and something that you will not see in most books or but you will see, but it's kind of hidden there. What you want to do is you want to, have to, to, to force the network to do an, a, an abstract representation. So let me show you one example. Let's say that I want to describe this, this flower. This is a picture of a flower. So the, pictures correspond, the picture corresponds to a bunch of pixels. This is probably, I don't know, it's like a 500 by 500 pixels. So here I have one quarter of a million pixels. Uh, but, but there is no semantic information. I, I have no idea. If I just see the, the pixels as numbers, I have no idea this is a flower. So now I can ask you to describe this flower in, in simpler terms. So a simpler way would be just to do this like pixels, not these are, these are just smaller pixels. So I have smaller pixels. And now the, the pixels, I could, well, it's, it's a little bit more abstract representation. I, I could go to something even more abstract where instead of pixels, I have little, little uh, geometric figures, like a little, little circles here, a little line. So it is still a flower, but now the elements that, that describe the flower are simpler. So I could, do, I could go even further and just write the elements of the flower and say that this is a flower with five purple petals and a yellow centers, center. I could go even simpler and say that this is a flower called Cosmos habitinatus, which is a very nice number, name for a flower, by the way. So you see that every time, uh, as, I, as I move through this little example, I have, uh, the, the information is more and more compressed, so it is sparse. I want to do a sparse encoding of my, of my original image. So I could give you all the, the numbers on this pixel by pixel for this, for this flower, or I could tell you that this is a cosmos flower. And it's the same, you will, you, will, you will understand that this is this flower. So that's what we want to do with a neural network. So what we do is that we lower the resolution and we force the network to forget about the pixels and think more about the structures in the pixels. We don't want the network to learn all the values in the pixel, but we want the network to learn the structure that formed this, this image, it, exactly in the same way as we saw here. So here we have pixels, and here we have structures formed by these pixels. This is what we want the network to learn. And one way of doing that is by lowering the resolution at every step. 
Okay, so we have this feature structure that is going to tell me the features in the, in the image. So now, once I have a bunch of features, I have here, the, uh, we have here some filters responding to the beak, to the eyes of the, the, the birds, the feathers. So now, how do I, how do I make a, a decision to know if it, that this is a bird? So what I do is then I combine the filters with, with more neurons. And these neurons we are going to mix the filters and tell me if, if you see a beak and you see feathers, it's probably a bird. No? If you will see, I don't know, uh, a trunk, it will be probably a, an elephant. So this is another toy, toy model of this. So we have here the picture of a dog and we pass the, the, the picture through a neural network that is going to decompose it into the features. So this, this is just something that I, I did by hand. But it's conceptually is, 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 is right. So you have here a bunch of features for, and this network has been trained with dogs and cats. So you have uh, features that correspond to a dog, but also features that correspond to a cat, like, like this and this. So then we have two neurons, and what the neurons do is that they collect the activation from these filters, and they tell me if the activations are, are mostly activations from a dog filter, it's going to be a dog. What I do is I pass it, and then I see that these filters react to this picture, and I see, okay, this, this neuron says, I have all these, this, this uh, filter with high weights, then it's going to be a dog instead of being a cat. And this is how neural networks classify images. So this is the basic idea. Every result that you will see around the papers that classify images or galaxies or, or that do predictions or any sort will have probably this kind of architecture. Okay. Now, how do, how do neural networks see the world? Because we see that networks uh, construct an internal representation of the world. So but what happens inside a, a, a network? So I'm going to show you some results from 2014 from Sailor and Fergus. What they did, that they, they took a, a, a simple neural network, just like the one that I showed you. You see, we have an input image and we have several layers. And every time we go to different layers, we lower the resolution. And then we have uh, some, some neurons that, is going to, that are going to help me make some decision. And what is the decision in this case? So what they did, is they took a very famous data set consists of a few million images in a thousand classes. So these images correspond to objects of uh, daily life, like the cars, and some, uh, some house appliances, and uh, landscapes, there is uh, any kind of thing. There are a thousand different kinds of objects, a thousand classes. So they train this network with a thousand classes in, in a few million images, and they went to see what, what, what do these filters look like. So, what you see here are the, the uh, 96 filters in the first layer. So you see that the 96 filters in the first layer basically encode gradients in combination of gradients, very simple gradients. So I'm going to focus on one particular filter, this particular filter. I'm going to show you something that I think is really cool about, about uh, neural networks. So you see this filter, uh, this neuron reacts to patterns that are dark, uh, bright and dark. And this is something that was, well, it, it has been known already for several decades that these kind of filters are, are also seen in, uh, in, in biological systems. So, in uh, 1959, Hubel and, and Wiesel, um, they studied the, the visual cortex in, in mammals, in cats in this case, so they, they put an electrode in the brain of a cat in the visual cortex, and then they stimulate the, the cat with images. And what they found is that there are some, some regions, some, some little, little columns of neurons that react to very particular features, like this case. So there, is, there are neurons in the, in the brain of a cat that react to patterns that are dark, bright, and dark. And when you have, you have a light source, and you move the light source through different, in different positions, and you see that when the light source is off the center, there is no activation, there is inhibition. When the light source is, is rotated with respect to this, to this pattern, these are, these are patterns in neurons. Then there is no change in the output. And if the light source is, is aligned with these patterns of neurons, then the, the neuron fires. And we, have, we also have these kind of patterns in, in, our, in our visual cortex. So to me, it is amazing to think that what we, this neural network is, is, a, is a computational system, but it, it is able to replicate what we see in biological systems. So they went further and then, well, this, this, this is for the work. Um, they're taking this, this, this network and analyzing the patterns inside. So what you see here are several, several filters, several neurons, and these are the images that make this neuron fire. So this neuron fires with these images 
in this neuron fire with these images. So you see how different neurons, they like different kinds of patterns. So we go to, to deeper layers, we see that the neurons now combine and form com more complex patterns. So now we see that the neurons are, represent more complex structures and these are the structures that made them fire. So these are, on the left you see the neurons, what the neurons, what the, the weights in the neurons, and on the right what you see is what the neurons like seeing. So when you show these images, this neuron here on the left will fire maximum. And when we go to deeper layers, we see even more complex patterns. So you see now how we went from very simple uh, gradients. Now we, we have some kind of textures here. We start getting even faces. And when we go to the, to the latest, uh, to the deepest layers, we can, we can make complete faces in the, inside the neural network. And uh, this is something that was actually discovered just a few months ago. There was this, this paper, I think, in Nature, where uh, they, they found that we actually have very few, very few neurons to identify for identifying person. So there is one little neuron in our brain that is good at finding a Mickey Mouse. And there is another neuron that is good at finding a Michael Jackson and so on and so. Just like, like artificial neural networks. So what do neural networks see? So once you pass an image through a neural network, what happens inside the, the, the network? So we know that this is, these are the filters inside the network. And this is the stuff that they like to see. So what happens inside when, when I pass an image? So I'm going to show you a result that I, that I, I did. Uh, it's a very simple setup as before. We have a neural network. Uh, it's, a, it's a common neural network and I train, but it, it has been trained, I didn't train it. It has been trained previously with this same data set with a few million images, a thousand classes. And then you see here the, the filters at different layers. So again, you see that filters at different layers are more and more complex. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass the image of a galaxy through these filters at different layers. So I'm going to pass the galaxy first at the, this, let me see, this is the fifth, at the fifth layer, I pass an image of a galaxy. So you see here, oh, this is the image, and these are different filters. I just take five filters from this, from this uh, layer. And you see here what happens when I pass this image through this filter, this is what I get. So different filters give me different aspects of the image. Of course, we are all familiar uh, with this. With this, no, this is what we do with convolutions. Uh, but our convolutions are much simpler than this. These, these filters are extremely complex and are very nonlinear. So this is the result of, the, of passing the galaxy through these filters, uh, very, uh, one of the first layers. If I go to a deeper layer, you see now how the resolution of the galaxy inside the network is lower. So let me show you again. So this is a, 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 a one of the first layers. Now the, one of the, the intermediate layers. Now the filters are more complex. The features that I can find are also more complex and the resolution is lower. Now, if I go to even deeper layers, I find out that some filters are finding uh, the spiral arms. If I go to, to deeper layers, I see some very weird filters that are good at finding the, the bulge of the, of, the, of the galaxy, for instance, but this filter is very strange. But it, it still manages to find the, the, the center of the galaxy, and this one too. And so and so. So one thing, I think one amazing thing is that these filters, so this network has never seen a galaxy before. This network was trained with, the, with objects of, the, of normal life, no? Like I show you on cars, on dogs, cats. It has never seen a galaxy, but it can still find some patterns inside the galaxy. And why? Because some patterns are common, like the, the bulge of a galaxy, the center looks more or less like an eye. And we find that eyes, uh, filters that are good at finding eyes are very good also finding parts of the, the galaxy, like the center. So the, the network basically, uh, creates an internal representation of the feature that it has seen. So and you see here, these filters correspond to things that the network has seen. So we can make a little experiment. So what I did is I took an, a, a, a very special kind of neural network called autoencoder. And this network, what it does, you give it an image and it gives you the same image. But before doing that, you lower the resolution and you create some kind of code or, or compressed representation. And then you expand this code to give you the, the image back. So I took this, this galaxy and I trained this network with one single galaxy, with one single image, until the, the, the network learned all the features in this galaxy. And then I pass a normal picture. So I'm going to pass the picture of a, of a butterfly. This is actually a butterfly that, that hatched in our house. So I'm going to pass the picture of this butterfly through this network. And this network has only seen galaxies before. It has never seen anything else except this particular galaxy. So what happened when I pass this, this butterfly through this network? 
but this is what I get. What I get is, is a representation of the, of, the, of the butterfly as if it was a galaxy. And why is that? Because this network has only seen galaxies. It, has seen, it hasn't seen anything else. So it thinks that this little, this little plant here is, is the, the center of a galaxy. No? And, and these, are, these are the star forming regions, these, these blue regions in the, in the, in the butterfly. So we, we, we see that the, the neural networks uh, make an internal representation of, of information, okay? So how do they organize this? Or is there any kind of organization in this internal representation? Is there something that I can, I can use to organize my, my data? So um, I did a, a little experiment here. This is, a, this is a standard. This is something standard in, in artificial intelligence. What I did is I took an image again, I passed it through a network, and remember that the network lowers the resolution and, and gives me at the end a very compressed representation of the image. So this is what, what the network gives me, a bunch of little images giving, giving me the most important features in the, in the original image. So this is usually a very long vector. This is, if, if I flatten this into, into one dimensional vector, I will get a vector with, with a few thousand elements. This, uh, this is the code of my image, no? this, this, these little images represent the most important part of the, the important aspects of this image. So since I have a very long vector, what I did is I use a simple technique called principal component analysis to find, in this case, the two most important elements in this very long vector. So that I, when I pass a galaxy, I pass this one galaxy, I produce a vector with several thousand elements. From these several thousand elements, I find only two principal components. So I can convert one galaxy into one single point into a new space. So this is, a very, this is a very strong compression. I go from, from a galaxy with a, probably a million pixels into just two, two points, just two coordinates, principal component one and principal, principal component two. So in this diagram, every galaxy corresponds to one point. And what, what do I do that? So I do that because now I can pass a bunch of galaxies and see how these galaxies are mapped into this new space. And this is what I, what I show here. So this is, this is, this is, this is the, the space of the principal component one and principal component two. These are a bunch of galaxies that I pass through the network. So the network analyzes the, the images and remaps the images into this new space. And look how the network actually does it. It, 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 make, it does a very nice arra arrangement. It gives me a nice classification into spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies and spiral galaxies. And it, it can do that even though it has never seen a galaxy before. And you can do that because, like I said, there are some aspects to galaxies that are common uh, with, with, with elements in, the, in normal life. This network can be used also to find, uh, to do real science, like to find outliers. You can see that there are some galaxies that look different than the rest of the galaxies. Not, like we have here a, a very nice red spiral. And you see that it didn't know where to put the red spiral, so it put the red spiral a little bit outside the distribution. So this is, uh, this is automatic work. That, I didn't do anything here. This, this is something that the, network, the neural network did automatically. Uh, some layers in the neural network are even able to, to give me the position angle of the galaxy. And again, just to, rem to, to remind you, these are filters that have nothing to do with a galaxy. These are filters that were trained with uh, normal light objects. So the same kind of techniques are being used in industry. This is something that I did with this company. Uh, I cannot show you the actual result, but it's something similar. So we were classifying objects from this a company called IKEA. And what you see here is uh, using something, something more or less similar, we can classify objects uh, by style or dividing between chairs and bases and so on and so on. So this is basically the same, the same, same techniques. And uh, we can do the same for Embody simulation. So here I took an embody simulation and uh, I, well, actually no, I didn't do it. My student, Anna Arcosi, Anna took an embody simulation and caught uh, little pieces of the simulation and then passed the little pieces of the simulation through a neural network to remap it into this two dimensional space. And you see that the neural network does a very good job um, clustering similar regions. So we have here regions inside a void. We have a filament here, or a, or a cluster. We have a, we have three filaments here. Okay, so this is all very nice, but can we interpret this space? Because you see what I have been showing you is basically a, a black box. 
It's just a magical box and you pass data through this magical box and you get some nice fancy results. But they don't mean anything. So for instance, I have no idea what these clusters are. So the neural network thought that these clusters were, uh, that, these, that these regions were somehow similar to each other, which they are, but what is the meaning of them? It doesn't know that these are filaments and that this is a cluster and this, this is a void. So we actually cannot, we cannot interpret this feature space because it is not semantic. The principal, principal components that I showed you here, the principal component one and two, have no physical meaning. So what is it? Is it complexity, this, this axis and this uh, number of branches here? Is this cluster uh, encoding some, cart some, some kind of straightness and bobbliness? And this is something that looks like a star and this is just the rest? So we actually don't know. This is just a, a, a black box. And this is something that was kind of, well, not in this context, but some, something um, uh, Jorge Luis Borges wrote about it in, in 1952 in this idioma uh, analytico de John Wink, uh, Wilkins, in which he talks about the Emporio Celestial de Conocimientos Benévolos, where he said that in this encyclopedia, animals are classified into pertencientes al emperador, embalsamados, amaestrados, lechones, so and so, etc., uh, que de lejos parecen moscas. And he's just making fun on, on, on the problem of classification because we cannot, any classification is intrinsically arbitrary. And a neural network is the perfect example of that. So then this network is classifying these objects or this, this piece of the cosmic web into three classes, more or less. But the classes are perfectly, are completely arbitrary. So this could be something that looks like a fly from far away. Now, something funny is that he, also in 1952, the same year when Borges published this work, there was this paper where they studied the, the brain of, of frogs. And what they found is that the receptive field of an, of an on-off unit will be nicely fit by the image of a, of a fly at two inches. So in the, in the brain of fly, there really is a neuron that, that finds things that look like a fly from, from a distance. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, so very briefly about so, some results on now applying this to, to science. So I, I will describe, this is a very simple architecture that is very common, it's one of my favorite architectures, it's called an autoencoder. So what is an autoencoder? An autoencoder is a kind of neural network where you have some image, the image gets compressed as we saw, you get some code of the image, so some bottleneck, and the, this, this code gets decompressed and you give, you give some kind of image at the end. So the trivial case would be you, you have one image, you compress the image, and you decompress the image to get the same, the same image. So this is something like when you take a picture and then you compress it into a JPEG file and then you decompress it. No, but here is not a JPEG, here is some kind of, it's just, it, it is a different encoding. So this is trivial, of course. We don't, this is not interesting at all, unless this, this code is good, but it's never so good. So what, can, what, what else can you do with this kind of uh, networks? So, one thing you can do is you can train this network to, to fix images or to change the input. So in this case, you train this network giving it a picture with, with some artifact. Here is, there is a cross. You tell it this is the input image and I want you to give me this image as, as the output. And the network will learn to, to fix these artifacts. You can also tell it this is my image and there are some labels here and I want you to, to transform this image into this new image where, it, where the labels are colored. Uh, differently. So this is the kind of neurons that people use. This has been used to, to mask uh, interference in radio frequencies, in radio data, sorry. Uh, people use it also to, to cut images, like in this case, a, a car. Um, I used it uh, last year, I called this paper where I took a neuro, this kind of architecture to, to train it. So we input um, a density field, and then it gives us uh, the distribution of galaxies, a uh, distribution of filaments, sorry. And uh, just to remind you, this is the same kind of network that we use to find these case chairs in, in industry. So let me just show you, this is, the, this is a 3D rendering of the network. So this, this is a very simple network and it can give me the same kind of results as a traditional method. The method that I use for training this network, I can do this transformation in a couple of hours and this network can do it in a couple of seconds. And actually, does it better than, than the method that I use to train it. So I'm going to show you another small experiment. Uh, this is something I'm, I'm, I'm writing a little, a little app for virtual reality. And for this app, I need uh, very clean images of galaxies. 
So this is an artistic representation of a spiral galaxy. Now, of course, galaxies never look like that. We know that very well. No? This, uh, this is a nice galaxy. An artistic is not very realistic, actually, but it looks very cool. And here on the right, we have a real galaxy that has some stars and even some saturation here. So it never looks like the artist representation. So I want to clean my galaxies to, to, to I want to remove the, the the stars and other galaxies and any artifact in the images. So how would I do that? So I want my galaxy, I want to clean a clean galaxy. No, the, the easiest way to do it is with an autoencoder, but now there is a catch. I, I have to train an autoencoder, remember? In this case, I, I, I need the, the dirty image, so here the image with an artifact, and I also need the clean image because I'm going to tell you, this is the image that I want you as an input, that I give you as an input, and this is the image that I want at, as the output. So I need the, the dirty image and the clean image, but I don't have that. In my case, I only have the dirty image. We, we, we don't have many clean images of galaxies. So we can do a, a dirty trick, in, in this case, literally a dirty trick. So what we do is we add more noise because I don't have clean images, but what I can do is I can produce very dirty images. So what I do is I have my original images and I just add a bunch of fields with, fields with stars. So then I can train my, my network with uh, the original galaxy plus a bunch of noise, and I can tell it, okay, this is a very dirty image, and I want you to give me a, a, a more or less clean image. So at the end, I will give it the original image with uh, just a few galaxies, and, and I expect it to give me something cleaner than this, than this image, and this is what it does actually. So here you see, these are just a few examples from the DESI, from DESI, uh, from DESI survey. Here is the, the original image, and this is the, the image once it has been cleaned by the network. So I think something very, very cool of this is that I, I, I don't need to know how, how a clean galaxy looks like. I just have to know how a normal galaxy looks like and how a very dirty galaxy looks like, and I can do this clean. So i just show you a couple of examples. And just to, to finish my talk, I'm going to tell you about uh, some of my latest work. In the last, but during my talk, I've been showing you neural networks, and they are basically these black boxes, not these magical boxes. You pass dirty images, and it gives you clean images. But we don't want that as, as scientists. As physicists, we want to have some understanding of what happens inside the neural network. So this is some work that I, I developed last year. It has, been just, it has been just accepted this month. It's a kind of neural networks that are aware of physics. So they are based on the autoencoder. So the autoencoder is like I showed you, in an autoencoder you have some image or some data. The data gets compressed. You have here the compressed representation and then it gets decompressed and you get something similar to the original image or some aspect of the original image. Now here, this, this uh, representation is, is not semantic. It has no meaning. No? It's just a compressed representation of what the network thinks that is more important about this galaxy. But it has no physical meaning. So how can we impose physical meaning here? So one way of imposing that is replacing the decoder in a normal network. This decoder is another neural network. But if I assume that this, this code here represents some physical variables, I can use these physical variables as an input for a physical system. So by doing that, I can impose a physical representation in my neural network. So in this case, I have a neural network with, with about a bunch of neurons and a bunch of neurons here. There is no physics here, it's just a black box. In this case, I have a bunch of neurons that are going to give me some parameters, or some, some code that has physical meaning. And I'm going to use this code that represents physical variables as an input for a physical model. And to put it more concrete, uh, more clearly, this physical model is going to be just an exponential profile, and these are the parameters. This is the major semi-axis, the electricity, and the position angle of the, of, of, the, of the galaxy. So this is the neural network. We have a galaxy here. Uh, you can see here the, the, the galaxy. Then it gets, uh, it gets uh, analyzed by the, by the network. And then you have here the code. And here you have here the, the three parameters. We have here the three parameters. And um, so these three parameters are used as an input for the, for the decoder, uh, which is going to basically just uh, evaluate these three parameters and give me a new image. So using this network, we have a system that actually knows about physics. It, has a, it produces an internal representation that is physically meaningful. In this case, it gives me the, 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 
the major uh, axis of the of the the profile, the electricity, and the position angle uses these three parameters as an input uh, for this just the exponential profile, and then gives me the, the actual image. So what, what we did, we trained this with several thousand images that we several thousand artificial images, and this is what we get at the end. So let me just show you this. This is the original image. This is the input image, and this is the reconstructed image. So if we see here the parameters. This is the the real. Uh, Major access. Can I ask a question? I guess. Sorry. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Will Henry. It's a very interesting talk. I'm just wondering about in this case where you have a physical model in the middle of your neural network, what, what advantage does the neural network give you over simply doing a least squares fit of your physical model to the original images? Yeah, yeah, that's a very nice. Nice point. So neural networks are much more robust. So when you when you do a, I mean, you, you, know, you just get the chi square, no? Yeah. Uh, you know this this can be very stable. First, it takes a lot of time to compute and can be can be very stable. If you if you put if you have a nice galaxy, uh, a nice profile, it will probably give you a nice fit. But if, if your profile profile has a bunch of stars and has another galaxy nearby, it will probably probably fail. And we see that. No? I work all the time with the slow galaxies and. Sometimes the feet are horrendous, and it's just because it just failed. There was another galaxy, or there was a bright star. Now a neural network is very robust against this because remember, like I like I show in this case, you can train a neural network with a lot of noise, and that's actually what we do in practice. In practice, you never train a neural network with perfect data. You always introduce noise in the network to make it robust against this noise. So one thing that you can do here compared to just do a normal fitting is that you can produce networks that are really robust. Now, this network, I, I developed this network not for profile fitting actually. This was just a very fast, uh, just a very, very fast application. And the reason why I did, did that is because at the same time when I was, when I was working on this paper, Kinsey, then uh, Google released uh, a new kind of architecture, which is, is basically the same architecture. So I, I had to come up with something fast to, to, to release the, the technique. So uh, uh, Google released the same kind of architecture where you have a, an, an input image and then you analyze it, generate parameters for the image and reconstruct the image. No? So the original application for this was to reconstruct initial conditions, not to do profile. Profile, profile fitting is like a trivial example of this, of this network. So okay. this network, I, I, I designed this network so that I can input here final conditions from a galaxy distribution and then have as the code the initial conditions that generate this final distribution have an embody code here that generates final distribution from the initial distribution. So these kind of networks are very good in, case, in cases where you don't know the initial conditions of your system. So you only have the final condition, but you have a physical model of your system. You can, gener you can train this network and you can, you can predict the, final condi the, the initial conditions from the final conditions. So yeah, um, this is a trivial application of this network. No? Maybe a chi-square would be the same good but in some cases, not in some cases, in cases where the image is very dirty, uh, a neural network will give you better results. So I will not, also, I will not use this, the results from this network as the final result because sky square is always much, uh, it always gives you better results. So I think the one way of applying these networks is giving you like a first kickstart. So you pass this, your images through these kind of networks, you get a very good set of parameters and then you can refine with other more traditional techniques. So I, okay, thanks. Yeah. So I I don't I don't advocate for using neural networks as an as a as a full solution at least in astronomy, because the traditional techniques are are, are still better than than these networks. You can actually see here. Let me show. You. Um, so you can see a very nice fit in between the the predict the the real uh, value and the predicted. But here you can see actually some problems. If the neural network here failed, uh, in this case, in, in, in angles close to zero, between, yeah, close to zero and 180, and that is because the network just couldn't decide if it was zero degrees or 180 degrees and put something in the middle. Uh, but we know that um, if you do a, a normal fitting, you would not see, you, you would not have this kind of problems. So these networks are very good at giving you the first your first value, no? and from that value, you can, you can take a normal technique and just refine it. That's how we use it at least. Okay, so like I said, these this kind of architectures are very, are very flexible and, and, 
we already, uh, I, I already collaborated on a paper using this technique, this, this network uh, applied to material sciences. And uh, Google already identified this technique also as very important. And they have this, this kind of architecture where you can get an image and get the, the, the parameters of this image, the camera and all the elements in the image so you, you can reconstruct it. So from an image, you can actually get all the elements that were, that were used to produce this image. You can use this kind of network to train a robotic arm because I don't know how, I don't have to know how to use a robotic arm. I just have to know, I just have, I just need a model of my robot, which is the robot itself. And the semantic code will be the instructions for the robot. And I can just tell the robot what I want it to do. I don't, I don't need to know how the robot works. I just need a model, which is the robot itself. So I can, I can train the robot with this kind of architecture without knowing how, how they work. And I can also train a, a car to drive by itself because the decoder is the car itself. And the semantic code here, the code will be the instruction for the car. And this is something that we do when we, when we drive. If I take a new car, if I drive a new car for the first time, the first thing that I do is I, as, I start, as I start the car, I move the wheel a little bit to the left and to the right to feel it, not to see how the car steers as I move the wheel, the steering wheel. So when, I, when, when, I'm, when I'm doing that, what I'm doing is I'm actually training my brain or retraining my brain to this new car. I'm retraining the neural network. So I'm training my encoder so that it can, it can adjust to the steering wheel and the gas so that, so that it can control the model, which is the car, and I can drive. And uh, with this, I finish my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Gracias. Thanks, uh, Miguel. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, so, can I see some hands go up? Uh, people have questions. Um, I, I, I don't have a. I don't see the button, but I can. I can ask a question. Um, so, um, oh, okay. So, Jane. Jane. Okay, maybe we should start with Jane. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, so, Jane, please, please go ahead. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, very interesting talk, uh, Miguel. Um, I want to ask that um, if your if these neural networks would be any good at comparing spectral templates, because all your examples were images, but if the same could be done comparing spectra against spectral templates. Yes, I, I think they have been done. Even I don't follow this 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 line of uh, applications in astronomy, but I think they have been used for that. I may uh, this, this will be, uh, will be like, uh, actually yes. The uh, problem is very similar problem to speech recognition, right? So this is a, a well-known problem, I think. And yeah, they could be applied to. If I may interject, uh, actually uh, yes, in the optical, this is actually uh, pretty well studied. They have compared the results of uh, machine learning uh, comparisons to templates versus PCA. And it seems to do at least as, as good, if not better than PCA. Uh, in the infrared, it's not very well studied, but my student, Emir, is working on that. So that was a shameless plug on that. Oh, cool. cool. Okay, thanks. All right, um, Vicente and then Will. Um, okay, yeah, I was, I was just very curious. Uh, if, if you go back in your presentation to your galaxy, uh, to your um, convolutional neural networks and, and the, the galaxies. Yeah. Um, but by the way, very nice talk. I, I think this is the, I think this, this is the clearest explanation I've seen of uh, these convolutional neural networks, CNNs, uh, which, oh. which, which, which I have used actually indirectly in my work, but they were just uh, black boxes. Um, no, if you go uh, earlier, like 20 slides earlier or something. Um, oh, yeah, 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 no, it's uh, 50, and which is 60, 60, uh, yeah, 66 or 67. Or um, next one. Yeah, so, so, so you have two different kinds of, um, okay, so, so, okay, so you have an original galaxy image, then you have, the panels on, on the on the top or on the middle are those what 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 people sometimes call the attribution maps, which is like the you know which 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 pixels are the most uh, important for for the neural classifier. Or, yeah. And well, and then and the other part of my question was uh, the ones. Sorry, sorry if I missed it, but I didn't really. Uh, get what, what were the ones in the bottom because th those those panels in the bottom they seem 
almost as, <laughs> as complicated as the original. Uh, image, they, they seem to have a lot of uh, details. So. This one here? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, this, okay, this, these are the, well, these are the filters, the, the neurons themselves. It, they are not actually the neurons themselves. So, uh, okay, this was more technical. I didn't want to explain how you, you create them. <clears throat> the way you create these images is uh, to take one filter, you, you identify one filter, the filter that you want to store it, or the neuron that you want to store it. And then you start with the neural network and you pass, you pass uh, to this neural network uh, normally just noise. You pass, you pass noise and then you pass it through this and this noise is going to use some activation at this particular filter. So what you want to do then is you want to, you, you change this, this noise in this image so that the, the activation in this neuron will be uh, maximum. So this is an iterative process. What you do is you pass the image through the filter and then you see the activation and then you change the image in the direction that will maximize the activation of this filter. And at the end, what you get is you get the image that will, will give you maximal activation for this particular filter. And that's how you create these images. So I say that these images were the neurons. They are not the neurons, but these are the, the images that make this filter or this neuron activate with a maximum response. I see. Okay. Okay. I think I got it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So the, the, it's very difficult to visualize uh, what a neuron sees because like I, I have this, uh, this story example. Let me see. Because the neuron is connected to other neurons. So. So clean. So like here. So the, this neuron is connected to other neurons and to other neurons and to other neurons. So if I show you the activation from one single neuron, is uh, sorry, the, the, the weights in one single neuron is just a pattern of three by three. No? It's just that three by three pattern. But this three by three pattern is connected to other neurons and to other and to other. So that's how they produce these very complex patterns. So yeah, these are the neurons that, that, feed, that work on both with this image to generate this image. Is that clear? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Vicente. Uh, Will? Yes, okay, thank you. So, um, I have one more question, um, general about the field, really. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in this at all, but I've, one of the things I've noticed recently is a lot in the neural networks is being talked about the adversarial uh, networks in which we have two different sets of networks, one of which is trying to fool the other one. Uh, have you had an experience of that? Has is, is that got any application to astronomy? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm actually playing with them. Uh, I've been playing with them these days. Uh, so, I don't know. I, I'm actually using them uh, because they, they are very good. Uh, so, I'm training one, one of these uh, adversarial networks to decify slow and galaxies. So, I input slow and galaxies, and as an output, I get a slow and galaxy how the way it will be seen by TESI, by the TESI survey, no? Mm -hmm. So, but this is not for real science. There was even a paper uh, when all this craziness about neural networks start, was, was just coming, there was a paper where they claimed that um, this uh, um, uh, adversarial network could be used to, to, clean, to clean galaxies, to decompose galaxies uh, beyond what you would do with normal techniques. And they have several examples that look just amazing. You know? They look really impressive. They have a very dirty galaxy and, and they, act, they clean the galaxy and look sharper and looks better. Uh, the problem with the adversarial generative um, networks is the generative part. So when you look in detail in this paper, they actually don't mention it, but it's very clear when you look at in detail, you see that there are a couple of galaxies, a couple of stars that are replaced by galaxies in the, in the clean image. So then the neural network takes something that takes a star and it, it, it thinks, oh, this actually looks like a galaxy. And then instead of the star, it, it puts a complete galaxy there. So I would be very careful using these kind of models for real science. There was also a, a paper last year where they took, they trained these uh, adversarial networks to de blend galaxies. So you have one galaxy on top of another one, and then you can train it to separate the two galaxies. And of course you produce pretty pictures, but what do they mean? No? There is a part of the galaxy that was missing because it was, was occluded by the other galaxy and the, the network just hallucinate this piece. So I wouldn't do any science with them. In my case, I'm using it because I'm making this app mm -hmm. and I'm, it's going to be just something for outreach. And for outreach, it's perfect. You produce beautiful pictures, but just that. Okay. Yeah, so here the problem Thanks. is- That's very clear explanation. 
Uh, they, they, they probably think they, they generative aspect of these networks that they actually generate new stuff. And we don't want that. Mm -hmm. I want my data to be just my data. Okay. We have uh, Rosa next. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Very nice talk, although I wasn't able to be for in the beginning, Miguel. Um, I have a question. So in your same image that you have displayed, number 66 or 65, in this case, um, what are the two principal components and how are they chosen? It was it uh, in the mapping, right? Yeah, this, yeah, it was this, well, that's what I, no, 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 that one, no. The same one that you put up for Vicente, which was, I think, 65 or 66, one of these. So maybe I misunderstood, but I thought that, that then, once you decompose by passing the image through these filters, you choose the two principal components. Oh, the no, no. Organs, not there. Yeah, that, you, could also, you, you could do that. Uh, you know, these, these things are so, because this is not real science, they are so flexible. You can do anything you want. Uh, this would be funny, uh, but like I said, there's, from the there's science, not, Sorry, there's not an objective way in this case of choosing the two principal ones. So in this case, in this particular case, what I did is I choose the five filters that give me the, the highest response. So, this, this, so these are the highest response to all the filters. This, this network, I don't remember how many it has, but it probably has like 200 or 500 filters. So at, at, in every picture, I show you the, the five filters with the, with the maximum response. Okay. And this is one way you could do that. And, and I, have, I have used that uh, the other way, like in this case, is I use, use principal component analysis and then all these responses get, uh, what you do is uh, all the responses from every filter, first you flatten them in order to use PCA, you flatten into one of vectors and you, you concatenate all the vectors so you get a huge vector, no? thousands of components. And then you just, you just get, in this case, the two principal ones. And this is just something that you, you, you choose. No? When you do PCA, you choose how many principal components you want. In this case, I just choose two. It's, it's, it's not really right because you have a vector that has thousands of components and you just compress into two. But this was just only for visualization purposes. When, when, when we do actual analysis, uh, we, we do more than two components. So, uh, 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 continuing on this question, so uh, in this case, to select the PCA components, this is the same as in regular PCA where you just pick the two largest eigenvectors, eigenvalues? Yes, yeah, okay. yeah. And in this case, uh, the, the motivation is just to reduce the number of dimensions because I have a vector here, and what I want to do is I want to show this galaxy in some space, and the vector the vector of characteristics here is too large, no? it has thousands of components. So I just want to show it in X, Y plane, that's why I use PCA. And there are other techniques, there are more fancy techniques for doing that, but this is, for visualization, this is just okay. Thank you. So there are, I think, um, the, the point that you made is very important. This, there is no one way of solving or, or approaching these problems. And I think that is also part of the reason why there is kind of a, a resistance uh, for using these kind of uh, techniques in astronomy because it really looks a lot like, like uh, you are cheating or just doing black magic. And that's part of my, my research uh, in the last couple of years, trying to bring some physics and some methodology into this because all these techniques were, were designed for finding the chairs no, and this kind of stuff. Like I said, this is what we do in industry. And you don't really care how it's done. You just, you just want it done this week because next week the client wants the results. So they don't really care. As, as long as it works, it's okay. Uh, but we don't want that. We want, we want to have something methodical, no? We want to have some physics done. Uh, but if you see the, the work done in industry, is not like that because it, that's not the purpose. No, the purpose is just getting results, getting money. <laughs> Can, can, I, can I ask one, one last question? Yes, I was going to say one, yeah. Yeah, so, so Miguel, I understood also that, that you have some uh, actual experience in, in industry in applying this, these uh, techniques to, to industry or, or, or did I misunderstand that? <laughs> yeah, 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 so even right now I'm advising this guy. So there is a, uh, there is a startup called Lexit, it's actually his name, and these guys do interior design, but now, now they do some other things. Um, so they approached me uh, a couple of years ago because they had some problems with a neural network that was too complex for them to understand. So they wanted me to, to explain it to them. 
And then uh, we ended up uh, doing some interesting things together. So now, like now I'm again uh, advising them and, and just guiding them how to, how to yeah, make some new architectures for them. Uh, so, so that is something really cool. And I was, it's that's something that I wanted to mention just, just uh, before saying goodbye. Uh, I don't know if there are students uh, here uh, listening, uh, but I would advise you, uh, artificial intelligence gives you a, a nice set of tools that you can use in astronomy. You, you see, now you can use them as a black box to solve fast problems. I didn't mention other problems, other applications that we have, but they are like a magical box that you can use to test theories really fast. You, you can test something extremely fast, something that will take you a month, you can test it in hours. You can also do science, but you can also apply to industry in case, uh, I know some students that may not want to continue in, in astronomy or, or their, their, their plan change at some point. Uh, so this gives you a, a set of tools that are really in high demand right now. So since I am, since I'm working on, on artificial intelligence, I have a LinkedIn account, uh, a profile, and I get approached all the time uh, by companies asking me to apply. Uh, this is something, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a common experience for people, for, for, for uh, researchers working in, in artificial intelligence, that companies approach you uh, because they want people. To, there are not enough people working in this field and there are even less people working in this, this field who actually know what they are doing. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I, I agree. <laughs> so once again, thank you very much, Miguel. Let us all uh, thank the speaker. Well, thank you.